the big brawl breaks out at the club. Joe's Joe doing what he's doing with his hands, and um, he like got taps him on his shoulder, and he like don't you remember me? Basically, it's boy George. George, and he like and he tells Fat Joe says, "Man, you know I really kind of like you, kid. I'm about to go out of town, but when I get back in town, I'm gonna holler at you." Mm -hmm. And Joe is just on cloud nine because. As he said, you you go on blocks in the Bronx and there'd be nothing but hobos and bums and dope fiends and mm -hmm. hobos and bums and dope fiends. The next day you'd go on the same block and it'd be 10 Mercedes mm -hmm. and eight Jaguars and you'd be like, oh, boy, George didn't hit this block. Yeah, right. Right? Yeah. So he's thinking, you know, fame, fortune, glory. What he's talking about, he's going to take 100 people to New Adventure. He's about to buy 100 Benzes. He's already spending all the money that he's about to make. Because um, to go back, I guess after the tourist people got popped, boy George fills the void. He then gets plugged in with some Chinese, so they was probably getting that China white. Oh, absolutely. And um, at that time, you know, and 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 everybody who knows anything, everyone. Whether it be from Eddie Jackson to Nicky Barnes to Frank Matthews to Ike Atkins, anybody who ever was able to get their hands on a bag of China White made phenomenal amounts of money. Absolutely. In fact, it's that China White that still got the world messed up now because niggas <laughs> trying to chase what that China White bag could do. And I, I hate to be the bearers of bad news. Nothing can chase. That China white bag. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be awesome. It, just, it can't be done. You can put a 90 on this shit. Look. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> you, whoa. How you going to do it? You can put a 90 on Life it, in the fast lane, boy. <laughs> yeah, how can I get a job right Special here? Special delivery. You got China white right here. <laughs> um, so, though, as it was to go, um, actually, one of the guys who introduced, it's a real tragic story. One of the guys, I guess they call him Mike in some of the stuffs, and another guy named 6 0, mm -hmm. who was a part of uh, Boy George's organization. This is according to the internet now. These are not Detroit people. I, these, I'm chronicling and analyzing some stories we did, some, reach on, uh, some research on. Um, they introduced my, he was introduced to some feds by people very close to this organization. In fact, I believe there's 31 people indicted, half of them flipped, which was odd back then for that many. Um, people didn't cooperate as much back then as they do nowadays. But unfortunately for Boy, I guess they were looking. Um, but yeah, some of his closest people rolled on him. His crew got hammered just like the crew that he had inherited the throne from. Mm -hmm the Torres family. Mm -hmm. um, but within two years, um, he had become the biggest thing in Harlem. Uh, Fat Joe Riss calls him the black big meat, or the Latin or Spanish big meat, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. I think he called him the Latin BMF. Mm. Um, yeah, to be, to be precise. In 1988, they rented a party. And again, boy, when you're young, getting that money, you can do some fly stuff, but it'd be some of the stupidest shit you'd ever want to do. So, flyest shit you'd ever want to do is to run a yacht, get you and every crew that you hustle with and get money, throw a party, have $100,000 giveaway raffles, put each crew at a table just so if any of this ever gets documented, you can done the feds research for them. That's his crew for that neighborhood. That's his crew. And you put them all at one table and you take a bunch of pictures and you chronicle that this is my people from this block, these is my people from this block, and you give lieutenants Rolexes, and you give crew bosses kilo chains, and you do do some shit that they still will be talking about 30, 40 years later, but it's also the things that are going to bury you in court. Yeah, that's a lot of money going around there. But when you don't know, man, you don't know, um, it's such a cautionary tale. Because again, he only he only hustled for two years. His name's still ringing. Mm -hmm. um, according to the feds, when they popped him, he was running a fifteen million dollar a year operation, and that's got to be a low number because from all the people in the streets to talk about the kind of numbers he was running up, mm -hmm. um, I don't think the feds know that China White could take a ninety. 
I don't, I don't think they'd be calculated like that. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> if they knew, if they knew that Channel White really was taking a ninety, they'd recalculate that fifteen oh, million. Man. Um, but yeah, George Rivera's for people interested in this kind of stuff. Um, his name goes up there. It was a short run, mm -hmm. but it was a glorious run mm -hmm. um, to all accounts. It's all kind of stuff out there on him. I think the only interview ever done on him was Don Diva's. I have to find that one. Shout okay. out to the big homie Kevin Childs. Big up. Don Diva fame. Uh, the homie um, Vario of Don Diva fame. Um, yeah, but I, I don't think he's been chronicled. And there's lots of interviews and anecdotal stories about him and his run. But yeah, George Rivera. Boy George, man. Yeah, he's a whale. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a short run. But again, the... Um, we just don't be knowing. When you come from those impoverished situations, it's easy to pass judgment. But everybody know the first time you get money, you're going to fuck it up. You just got to hope that God can bless you to get it again after you fucked it up the first time so you know what to do with it the second time, third time. Then you can start thinking about all those kind of things. But no, he's he famous, famous, man. Mm -hmm. Famous, famous. George Rivera, Big boy fella. George. So, oh, yeah. enough on that. Um... To kind of switch lanes of what else is being talked about out there on the internet and black YouTube and all that kind of stuff is Killer Mike did a great interview. Very much so. Killer Mike, shout out to Killer Mike. He's got a new album out. We seldom do this, give out plugs, unpaid for plugs, but I think in this case it's uh, warranted. Uh, mm -hmm. He's got a new album out called Michael. People yeah. say that it stands a good chance. They say it's about it's going to be one of the best albums of the year, hip hop. Yeah, they ain't holding them up. He was on. We're talking about he was on the Math Hoff, uh, uh, my expert opinion podcast. Shout out to those guys. They're doing great work there and just, absolutely just killing the game over there. Mm -hmm. um, had fat, had, had big Mike uh, or Killer Mike rather on there, and uh, yeah, that's what they were saying. They, he's like, if he don't win best hip hop album. There's been, a, there's been a crime. Right. And But all those guys, and that was all real hip-hop heads were on that show. That's right. They uh, concurred to heat that he brought it. It's some grown. It's supposed to be some grown man rap. Because mm -hmm. he says he's not trying to chase the kids. Yeah. He's not trying to be like the kids. That's right. He's um, telling the story of an African-American male from the South brought up during the era of black empowerment in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And um, how he got to be where he at, you know, he's really, really politically active. Um, you know, the first time I came across, when did you, well, the first time I asked you, when's the first time you heard about Killer Mike? Killer Mike, I heard Killer Mike uh, back when they had the Dungeon Family with uh, Outkast. And uh, okay, that's was, who put him on. He was, right, exactly. That's when I first heard about Killer Mike. And then I began to hear about his, uh, you know, his political side and his, you know, he was like an advocate. Yeah. You know, and that was like maybe about five, six years ago. Okay, so it was Jay Z's Pop and Tags remix. Okay. He's on that with Hova. Okay. Twister. Yeah. Big Boy. Mm hmm. And Killer Mike. And that was classic. That is a classic. And that's when, because I was like, who is this kid, this guy here? He's like, he just held his own with Hova, yeah. Twister, oh, yeah. and Big Boy. So if you're on a track with those guys and you hold your you own. You got some weight. You, I'm like, this this guy. And then, you know, we I got into him a little bit. Like, he does some conscious rap. He does all kind of rap. Yeah, he has a group called Run the Jewels. If you ever get a chance, check out Run the Jewels. Uh, it's, it's him and LP. Real, re really good stuff. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, he, he was on... Um, my expert opinion, and they was chopping up some really good game. But the point that they brought up in the interview that I thought was really worth to kind of ties back into the stuff we talk about and do around here um, mm -hmm. was that period in Atlanta was very much like Detroit, the neighborhood he grew up in, where the preacher, the numbers man, the hustlers, the school teachers, the lawyers all lived in one community. And we're all involved in stabilizing that community, right? And um, there's a couple of names that he dropped, and you guys got some information on these guys because I think they, they I, I really want to do some research on them. There was two heavyweight hustlers out of Atlanta, um, one by the name of Q-Ball and another by the name of Cato. They okay. all grew up 
with the guy Russell, Herman Russell. Remember, we were just at that Russell mm-hmm. Center. The Russell Center, yes. Who, of course, the black guy who built Whew. the um, Hartsfield Atlanta Airport. Yes. They have a great black entrepreneurial yes. um, incubator program down there in Atlanta. Yeah. Um, on North Side um, in Castleberry area called the Russell Center. But so he's famous because he's been a hell of a black entrepreneur and, and um, his family's keeping his legacy alive. But Killer Mike was saying, and that's great. And, and um, then there was the brother Herman Cain, Godfather's mm-hmm. Pizza, who passed RIP, RIP to both Rest of those guys. Peace. You know, he got kind of blasted in the black press and in the media, Herman Cain, because he was, he ended up being in Trump's campaign and I Trump's heard, campaign. He ran for president. He yeah. ran for president. Yeah. He's got brother who started Godfather's Pizza. But he come up out the mud with all these guys. Mm-hmm. And and we, we should always remember that we got more in common just because you, he's a Democrat or he's an independent or he's a Republican. If you're a brother that came out the mud, you know what time it is. You know the struggle. You know the struggle, right? Um, but that this these guys, Q-Ball and Charlie Cato, so if you guys got any information on those guys down from in the A or people been down there, I guess they were mega players in Atlanta and contributed hugely to the civil rights movement. Right. Right? Right. Um, and then I, I ran their names just to qualify, not that I doubted Killer Mike's words, but before I got on the internet and started repeating Killer Mike, I said, let me call the old, the OG, the original OG, Ray Tatum, down <laughs> in Atlanta and be like, Ray, tell me about this cue ball and mm-hmm. Charlie Cato. And of course, mm-hmm. Ray, my man, shout out to Ray Tatum again. He, he of that age. And he like when I was a little boy, boy, them was some bad boy, them was some serious men. And then Ray Tatum say them was what you call some serious men. Yes, indeed. But if you if they liked the nigga and they, they knew your family, knew your mama and your sister and all them, all they was gonna say, boy, you wanna get some money, what you wanna do? He's saying every preacher and civil rights leader knew because we have to be realistic and this is what we've lost, that separation between the streets and the struggle mm-hmm. and, and that money in the streets being used and funneled to actually do something for the people and for the community, right? Right on. That these guys, and he threw up another guy that I'm looking for some information on if any of you guys got it, guy by the name of Wesley Merritt out of Atlanta. Ray puts him up there in that pantheon with this cue ball and Charlie Cato as just Atlanta hustlers from back in the day who really impacted that town that set the groundwork of why Atlanta is now considered the black Mecca. That without the functions of these guys like Charlie Cato, Q Ball, Wesley Merritt, Atlanta's not what it is now. It's not the hub of black entrepreneurship. I believe the last stat I heard was one out of every five African American in, in Atlanta have a business. Wow. One out of five, it's quite impressive. That's impressive. One out of every five, 20%. You know what I'm saying? But it, you know, let's keep it real. Before we start all that talking about they destroyed the neighborhood and then and, and, and a lot of these, especially if you're talking about that generation, they didn't destroy the neighborhood. They saved the neighborhood. That's right. Um, and it just, again, it reminded me um, of the help, you know, the Eddie Jackson, Milton Henry, of course, who was one of um, my pops, my dad and Eddie's primary lawyers. You know, Milton Henry was a Tuskegee Airman. Mm-hmm. Uh, it started an organization called the Republic of New Africa. We'll be covering and really going a little deeper in Milton Henry in Motown Mafia Reloaded. I yeah. mean, this is a guy who deserves a whole story in and of yeah. himself. Tuskegee yeah. Airman, bachelor's degree in, in, um, from Temple, uh, Yale Law School in Divinity, um, started the Republic of New Africa, was Malcolm X's chief advisor. But Heavyweight. But... When the Shrine of the Black Madonna or the Republic of New Africa needed some money, mm-hmm. they went to Eddie for it. And I'm not saying Eddie was the only one helping out the Shrine of the Black Madonna. I mean, that the huge was they were a big deal in this town. But he contributed. He did his fair part. Yeah. He definitely did his fair part to support the Republic of New Africa. And and Milton was kind of his conduit to the movement. And 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 the struggle absolutely in yeah. in, in above ground and and you know Eddie was kind of guy sound just like these guys out of Atlanta Q Ball Charlie Cato and West you know all you had to do was tell Eddie that it was a brother trying to help niggas because white folks is 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 treating the people bad and and this brother tried to do something about it and Eddie be like well how much you need 
Uh -huh. You didn't take much for those guys. If you said it's a brother really trying to do something to help the people, yeah. well, go ahead, man, give that boy some money. Let him help the people because we all we got. Absolutely. And they, those guys knew if the guy in the street handling the bag, if he ain't going, if he can't put no money behind it, then it might not be no money to get put. Who, then who will? Is John <laughs> Kennedy, to quote President Kennedy. If not us, then who? who? If not uh, now, no. then when? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, but we try to pass along. We don't hate on no other platform. Yeah, he you, did. He, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, Killer Mike about maybe, well, maybe I think it's been about five years. Did one hell of a uh, like uh, docu series called uh, Trigger Warning. I heard about that. Man, if you haven't seen it, check that one out. That was uh, you, you. You familiar with the Crip? Pop and uh, the uh, blood, yeah, yeah, he, I know he. I heard call him uh, blood pop. Now I heard him talking about that. I know he was involved in like telling the Crips and Bloods, you oh, guys need to man. brand brand these gangs, yes, and take this to a whole different level. Like how the Hell's Angel, I think he used the Hell's Angels as, it, as his example. Like it, it may still be on Netflix because yeah. that's where I saw it originally. But he uh, basically it was. Show and prove. It was like, uh, I think the first episode, he was talking about uh, spending money with black businesses, period. You told me about that. I did tell you about this uh, a few years ago. ago. Right. Right. And he said that uh, he wanted to go to a black hotel. Uh, he wound up on <laughs> so a park, park bench. bench. Yes. Yes. Right. But, um, I mean, he really showed and proved. I mean, much, much props to that, to that cat. If you haven't checked uh, out Trigger Warning, I think everybody should have a look at it. 